The first hurdle all new digitizers cross is that what you see on the screen and what you get when it sews out are never quite the same. And this is going to be a prime example of that happening. So make sure you stay tuned. Now, if you like these videos, be sure you hit that subscribe button and also hit that bell so you're notified every time we release a new video. Now this design was submitted on our Facebook group and it is digitized in Hatch. It looks super clean on screen. I asked them to send me the file, but they were worried about things lining up. Registration, the fill and the satin border were not lining up and that's the picture that they posted and they were wondering what was going on. Now I could tell right away by looking at the photo that this design was most likely uh, floated within the hoop. Now what I mean by floated is they did not hoop securely the fabric and the stabilizer within the hoop. They just hooped the stabilizer, maybe used a little bit of spray or in this case some pins to hold the fabric in place on the stabilizer and then they tried to run the design and the registration was way off. You can see that the uh, satin stitches are not matching up to the actual uh, fill stitches that were laid down first and there's lots of movement and this right away I would say is a big part due to the floating. I do always always prefer to see an item securely hooped within a hoop and then the design run. You might get away with it on simpler designs but as soon as you add a lot of stitches, a lot of fills or a lot of complexity where details need to have good registration you are always going to have issues if you try to float your actual fabric onto a piece of stabilizer as opposed to securely hooping it within the hoop. Now as we dive into this design, we're going to be calling it up on the screen. We're going to be looking at things like stitch directions, properties, as well as the sequence in which things are actually embroidered. And if I look at this right off the bat when it comes up, the first object that it actually does is the fill stitch. And that actually is a wise thing to do. You want to make sure that the fill is laid down first. And if I look at where the start and stops are, I can see that it actually starts and stops right to this point here. And then it goes to this piece down here, which gives me a little bit of an issue with regards to an unnecessary trim or jump in the design. So I am going to be looking at all of these factors as I actually go through the design to make sure it runs from the beginning to the end which it, with as few trims and jumps as possible. But I also want to look at things like stitch direction. And if I look at the stitch direction on this, I can see that the direction is actually 29 degrees. Now, if I'm doing a fill pattern that has a lot of different ins and outs and ups and downs on the shape, and I want this to run on, in this case, a sweatshirt, which I can see within the picture, I have to remember that a sweatshirt generally is milled with lots of little hills and valleys. They actually uh, construct it or sew it on the bias so that there is actually more stretch on the material this way and less stretch going vertically. So I have to take that into account because when you start laying down a lot of fill uh, stitches in a direction that is not horizontal, you're going to be sort of changing all of those little shapes that are being creating and they're going to be going in an angle which is going to be kind of not on that one horizontal and is going to be kind of changing from the uh, the hills and valleys which are vertically and it will cause a lot of distortion within that fill. So the first thing I'm going to do is change that fill to a horizontal so it's all one direction which means it'll be balanced on either side because this design is kind of symmetrical on either side. Now doing that I can also see when I look at it there has been very little if any push and pull compensation that is going on within this design. Now I'm going to change this color of this outline very quickly just so that we can see it on screen. And if you look at this outline here, normally within pull compensation, you want to make sure that the direction of the stitch is going to pull in. So I want to make sure that I exaggerate it. And the push is on the open ends like the top here where the uh, direction of the stitch and the opposing direction of the satin stitch are going to meet, that is going to push out. So I can't just create a 
uh, fill stitch that is right in the middle of the object because then you're going to have a lot of distortion within the design. You need to understand the principles of push and pull compensation and you create your objects based on the direction of the stitch that you choose beforehand. Because once you digitize something based on a stitch direction, you have to go in and change every single node to go in and recreate that. So I would not suggest necessarily doing it that way, but make your decisions first, and then you'll be able to go in and make uh, choices with regards to the nodes and directions of stitches and the properties based on that. Now another thing that I noticed is there is a very low density on this design. I can see that the spacing between the stitches on this fill is 0.26 millimeters of spacing. That means that it's very, very tightly uh, you know, close together from one layer of stitches to the next. Most times the default on a garment like this would probably be 0.4 millimeters. So it's you know considerably less. If I have opposing colors, like here I have really a white thread and I have a red background or garment, those are contrasting colors and that might be the reason why they chose more density because they were worried about the red showing through the white so the logical thing to do would be to increase the density. But that really is kind of the opposite. It's illogical because by increasing the density you're going to create more penetrations, more stitches. It's going to cause that material which is stretchy to start doing a little bit of a wave to it and eventually you will cover up the background color underneath but you'll have detrimental results with how flat the design stays down. You have to remember that every time you put a penetration into material it pulls up the needle when it comes up moves over and back down and when it pulls up it actually pulls up a little bit of the material which I like to call fabric lashes and that's what you're seeing through. So adding a lot more density is not the key. We're going to actually increase the stitch length a little bit so there's more coverage, less penetrations, less fabric lashes and the bonus is the stitch count is going to go down. So that's one thing that I want to look at right away is the stitch count of the design. This has 37,102 stitches. So we might as well round it off and say 37,000 stitches. And I'm going to uh, probably, as opposed to editing this fill that I have highlighted right now, I'm going to actually redigitize it because it's going to be much faster for me to do it based on the push and pull compensation manually than it will to try to go in and edit all of these nodes and change the curves from straights and everything else. I just uh, find it will be more effective time-wise and probably better results for me to just do it manually. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete that entire object. So let's just get out of here and I'm going to grab that object and I'm going to delete it. And my next object that's going to show is this one right here this little uh, talons and I'm going to hit the H key so I can see that the start position is right there. So now I know where I want to end my fill because I want it to join up. Before the start and stop on the previous one was up here which meant that after it did the fill the machine stopped, it trimmed, and then went down to this point here. And if I look at the stitching order as well, if I look at all of these pieces, there is all of these pieces, and I don't know if it's really traveling closest point, but we'll face all that when we come to it, and we'll make sure that we have things that actually connect as it goes. But this finishing stitch right here, which I can see, and let's just go here, turn this one off. I can see that I have a finishing stitch. I have these out in the middle of nowhere. So I might as well take this one and move it up right now because I want to make sure that if this is the object before it and I hit that H key, there's a start and a stop. And let's see where this one starts and stops. The start and stop is way over here. So I'm going to make sure that I start right over here so that I'm going to get rid of that unnecessary trim. So there's one trim already done. And for the rest of the objects, I'll go in afterwards and I'm going to have traveling stitches between them so we get rid of all of those unnecessary trims. Now I'm going to start to digitize the fill. And to give you an idea, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. So I'll zoom in with my zoom box and I'm going to come right to this point here. 
And if I see a line right there, this would be the type of line that I would create if I were to uh, look at that push and pull that I was talking about. Anywhere if I have a horizontal stitch, I would make sure that I have my points down here for my push and for the pull I'd exaggerate the outside a little bit. So let's just go to my 6 to 1 scale and there I am, I'm at 6 to 1. I'm going to go to digitize close shape which we're going to do as a tatami fill stitch and I'm going to start right here and I'm going to exaggerate my fills as I go around and kind of accommodate for that push and pull. So here I'm going to come down closer to where it meets and then come further to the outside and same thing here. This is going to come right here. This is going to be exaggerated in a little bit back out to the, the outside. So I'm not going exactly in the center as we would have seen before. I am actually cutting short on the open ends and pushing out on the outside. But when I get into areas like this, I have to adjust for that push and pull compensation all the way around. So it is one of those things that you do get used to and that's where education is the key. Learning all of this type of uh, manual inputs of push and pull compensation are things that we do teach in our Digitizer's Dream course and it is a foundation to help people get past that learning curve. Uh, digitizing is something that is a learned behavior. There are set guidelines and rules and there is a lot of rules that uh, are based on properties and on the stitch types that you're using but they generally stay the same as far as the principles of the rules and they just get applied to different designs over and over and over again. So it does take some time and practice to learn the art of digitizing but once you do have all of those foundational rules in place then it's a repetitive you know practicing and the more you do like anything else in life the better you get nobody you know buys a piano and in uh, one or month later becomes a concert pianist it takes years and years of practice and dedication to learning any art or any skill and creating embroidery designs is kind of the exact same thing. You don't have to create extremely detailed designs at the beginning of your career, so to speak. You start at the beginning like everybody else and you start to learn how to create easier designs. And then as time goes on, you get more and more complex. You start to challenge yourself and that is the fun of learning anything is the more you practice the better you get so i am just going all the way around here manually putting in my points adjusting for the push and the pull compensation exaggerating the direction of the stitches and cutting short anywhere that it's going to have what i like to call open ends and i'm just going to come right here come all the way this is now going to come short because it is the direction of the stitch. This is the direction of the stitch here. This is moving around. When you start to have all of these varying shapes, your push and pull will change based on the shape. A lot of people when they first start, they just go right in the center of this object and start creating the shape. And then after it's done, it sews out on the machine and they wonder why things didn't line up. You know, why is the fill stitch have, you know, a gap between the fill and the satin? And they don't understand, you know, the separation of those stitches. And it is based on that push and pull compensation, which is what we are manually digitizing and taking into account for right now. So this is something that has to be kind of done manually. And I just continue to put all of my points down. I'm using kind of a combination of curves and straights based on the, I guess, uh, angle that I'm kind of trying to achieve. And again, this just comes with lots and lots of practice. Here, adjusting for the pull compensation, coming up more for the push, back to the pull adjusting for the push back to the pull 
and now coming to a straight object, now going back to the pull, coming up for the push, coming out for the pull, there's the push. Even though you're looking at a very simple one color design, when you get into the theory of some things, it, not, it isn't necessarily complicated, but it does take some time to learn how to properly put in your nodes. I've seen some people on different groups who will do simple designs and they will say they you know spent you know hours and hours and hours trying to get things to line up properly and that is one way to learn you you learn best almost from your trial and your errors and eventually if you do have the patience and perseverance you will pick this all up by yourself you will you know run sample after sample you'll see the results you'll just sort of you know figure out what happened eventually and kind of make it better as time goes on uh, but what we try to assist people with is getting past those hurdles or those learning curves and not having to do it all by yourself but giving you the information the theory and the knowledge that was passed down to me when I was 17 years old from an experienced puncher a Shifley puncher and passing that on to people who want to learn how to do it now. That's what this is all about. So I'm putting in all of these points manually. And this is what takes the time. This is where I've seen a lot of automated or automatic digitizing programs that do kind of, you know, look at colors and layers and they will automatically define objects. And this is usually where most of them fall short very quickly because they don't take into account this type of interaction. They just see a color and they you know plot down some points and they don't take into account the color that's going over uh, top of it, the type of stitch that's going over top of it. So it doesn't define whether it is a fill with a satin or two satins or two fills that are interacting, how things blend together. There's lots of different scenarios to consider when you're creating designs. Again, pushing and pulling. And we're almost back up to the top. So all of this manual input has been used to create this one object. I hit enter and there is my actual piece. Now I'm going to zoom into full screen just so you can see what I did. And if I look at this, I'm going to select it. I'm going to move it to the beginning of the sewing order. And now is when I'm going to make some changes. So I'm going to hit the H key and I'm going to make this instead of 15 degrees, I'm going to make this zero degrees. So now this is a horizontal fill. Now, if I look at the uh, spacing, it's the 0.4 millimeters that I talked about before. I'm going to actually increase the stitch length to five millimeters and that's going to create more coverage on the fabric less penetrations so even though it's almost going reverse i'm actually creating less stitches which you think would create less coverage it's going to give me more coverage because there's less penetrations i know that part gets a little bit confusing but when and i might even because this is white if i want to decrease the density i'll decrease it to 0.38 maybe so that way there's a tiny little bit more of space between those stitches. And then if I look at the um, type of underlay I have down, I'm just gonna use a regular underlay. I don't need a, an edge run, but I can use a tatami underlay. And I wanna make sure that my tatami underlay has a, a stitch length of four millimeters and a spacing of three. I could probably change that to four as well. So let's just do that. And that'll give me a little bit less in there. But that's really all I need for that. And that's going to give me uh, quite a, a, I guess, a, a few less stitches within the design. So if I look at this now, and I'm going to change also the start and stop. So I'm starting up here at the top, which is fine. And I'm going to stop right down over here 
because I don't want an unnecessary trim. So now if I look at the first object that I created and then the next object, it's going right from there to there with absolutely no trims in the design and that's going to look good. And right now if I just look at the stitch count so far, I actually am down to actually substantially less. I actually have 27,000 stitches. Now we are going to be making some more changes to this design to get better results and I'll probably go through these one at a time. I might grab two of these here. If I look at the type of underlay there is a zigzag with an edge run. That one would be good. If I see this one it has a zigzag and I'm just going to run through these zigzag, zigzag, zigzag. So all of these just have a zigzag stitch. I probably will grab all of those pieces and I'm going to make sure that they have a zigzag with an edge run because I want it to be nice and clean around the outside edges. And if I look at this one right here, this one has a zigzag. I'm going to change that zigzag to an edge run because I want it to have a even amount of break wall because when those stitches pull in the underlay is going to stop it. A zigzag underlay doesn't necessarily create a break wall. It creates more of a foundation on uh, you know those stitches but I want a break wall because it's a fill and a satin stitch that are opposing. So now I have 2800 so I'm still substantially less. Now I'm going to join all of these together so I can see this one go from here to here. So what I want to do is I want to go back to my digitize open shapes and I'm going to choose the same color and I'm just going to do a point right here and I'm going to follow right along and I'm just going to go right in the center here and create an underlay or a walking stitch. and I want to make sure that I join those two together. So I'm kind of using that black outline that I saw there for a walking stitch. So I know I'm going to fall right in the middle of that. So right here, come right over to here. And come all the way around. And I can see where that point is right over here. I'm almost back to where I began. And actually you can always hit the undo button. I'm going to come right to this point right here and stop. And there if I look I created a stitch. Let's just turn the true view on. The stitch is going right now over top of that but I want to grab that stitch right there and I'm going to move it right here in between these two and that got rid of that because the start and the stop, if I hit the H, it's start and stop over here and then when I look at the next object I want to make sure that I travel from here all the way up. So that's one thing that was kind of missed when they were creating all of these objects is you can't just digitize the objects, you have to create traveling stitches or a path to go from one object to the next. So let's just turn this off go back to my uh, digitize shape and I'm going to come here, continue all the way around making sure I have a traveling stitch you can use straight or curves for this because remember these are going to be underneath, they're going to be disappearing I just want to make sure that they are not falling outside so it's good to travel right in the middle of that satin stitch. And again this is taking a little bit more time but that's what digitizing properly is all about is almost like creating a little uh, map for your designs. In the old days we didn't actually have editing software. We digitized everything manually and we couldn't go in and change it. So a big part of our creating designs was actually planning them. We would sit down for sometimes half an hour or 45 minutes and plan a design. All of the steps, all of the colors, all of the objects would basically be mapped out before we ever picked up our panograph and started to create the actual design 
because you couldn't easily go in and just move start and stop points. You couldn't easily go in, or you couldn't not at all, go in and change nodes. Once you created something, that's just the way it was, so you wanted to make sure you got it right the first time. So now I'm gonna go right over to here, and I'm gonna hit that, and if I look at it, it's again running on top, but let's grab this, put it into place, and there I have that object right there. I'm gonna zoom in real quick, and I'm gonna look at this, turn off the true view, I can see those little trims and jumps, so let's just go here and say, there is my stop point, let's see where my next point is, there's my start, so I wanna make sure if I back up, I'm gonna make sure that my start and my stop are in the same point, there's my stop, there is my start, so there's my start right there, there's my stop, so here's my, there's that point. So what I want to do now is I want to have a connector from here down to here. So let's escape from there, go back to here, and do this little point right over to here, enter. And I'm going to move this one and move it right over to this point right here. And that way, and hit the H key. So let's grab these. So there's my start, there's my stop. Here's my start. There's my stop. Here's my start, there's my stop, and there's start and stop. So I have all of my pieces here. I just have one little piece right here, which I gotta figure out. So there's, up. Oh, that's why. So I wanna make sure that my start is down here and my stop's up at the top. Now we'll go back to see, and now I can see that that one now is gone. So let's just say there, and then let's do the next one, tab, and hit the H key. Start and stop, start and stop, start and stop, and then start and stop, and then here's the next one, which I need to go to the next piece, which is gonna be over on the other side. So let's just go here, zoom over, and I wanna make sure that I travel now from here over to here, and we are almost done fixing or cleaning up this design. This is where, you know, a lot of times, when I would be creating a design like this, I would probably end up digitizing it just as quickly as I would end up fixing somebody else's mistakes. You know, starting over from scratch and doing it properly is sometimes quicker than going in and figuring out what has, you know, what has to be changed or done uh, differently. So if I look at the next object, it's going right over to here. So I'm going to start right, let's say here, hit that, go to T for true view, and I'm gonna go right here, and I'm gonna make sure that I go to the next point right here. Again, turn that off now again. Let's go to true view, and if I look at my starts and stops, let's hit that H, and I wanna make sure that I start over here and end on the other side. That got rid of that trim. Now it's going to do this piece, start and stop, then it's going to do that piece. So let's just zoom in and make sure that we can see these last few little starts and stops because I want, might need to go in. So there is a start, there's a stop, there is a start and a stop. And then there's one more here where it starts. So there is a trim between those two. So let's just add one more tiny little piece from here over to here, hit enter grab that one, bring it up right in between those two last pieces, hit the H key, start and stop, and I now have absolutely no trims in this design until I get to that last piece. Except for right here, which I can see a trim, so let's go here, there is a start, and here is a stop. So now I've gone through this entire design, and I need to make sure that I check everything that I've done so far, because I am still a little confused here as to why there is a point there. Let's see where this one is. There is my stop function, so that's right there. Here is my start, there's my stop, and here is my start right down here. That's probably why. So let's just move these two and get rid of that one. And that got rid of the starts and stops. So it takes longer to clean things up sometimes than to manually do it, you know, I guess from scratch but we were able to go in there, identify all of those objects, make sure that we path them all together. Now there's one more final thing that I could do to this design if I wanted it to be absolutely perfect, 
and uh, that is to put in some safety underlay in this design and I will kind of map through this I'm going to explain it to you real quick and I'll probably fast forward to it so you can kind of get the idea of what I'm doing but anywhere that I have any fill stitches so if the fills going this way and then I have a in the fills the direction of my fingers and then I have a satin stitch going over top of it anywhere it's going to pull apart those two pieces I'm going to add a little bit of zigzag underlay so if I'm looking at this right here my zigzags would be right here a little bit right here right here 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 anywhere on these open ends where i know they're going to oppose i could actually create some underlay to make sure that that wouldn't have any issues and if i'm going to do it as the very first color and i like doing this and this is why i actually turned off my uh, edge run when i first looked at this fill object right here and I changed the properties before it had a edge run with a uh, underlay, a tatami underlay, and I turned off the edge run altogether. The reason why is sometimes I prefer to do my edge run manually to take into account that separation of stitches. So I'm going to change the color. I'm going to start to put down these points. I'll generate it. Then you'll see it go through really quickly because it'll take a little while. Don't want to bore you, but when we're done, I'll resequence the actual color and show you how it works. So I'll just choose a different color. I'll just choose a green color. We're going to change it back afterwards. I'm going to uh, create this in TrueView just so that you can see it. And I'm going to choose a uh, open shape and I'll just take my run stitch and I'll start right over here and I'm just going to start by putting some zigzags back and forth and there is my zigzag right there and then I'm going to come right down here this area right here is opposing so I'm going to create some little pieces where I can see it's opposing here it might oppose a little bit so there's a couple zigzags here's a couple zigzags and I'm going to go up over here this is going to oppose and separate so there's a couple zigzags this area might oppose a little bit right here so again just a couple little points to make sure that any areas in this design that would be opposing I'm just going in and creating some underlay and I like to call this you know underlay that's going to be underneath of the fill stitches but when those fills and satins cause separation what you're going to see underneath is a nice clean zigzag stitch that will make this design look like there's no gapping. You won't see any of the red fabric show through. So now all of our zigzag underlay is in place and I'll call this up to full screen so that we can see the entire design. And if I look at all of my objects here, I'm going to take them all and I'm going to make them the same color as the rest of the design and I'm going to move them in the sewing order up to the very beginning. So what it's going to do is it's going to start if I grab the first one start here and over here and as I tab through and I see how it creates each of the uh, pieces it's going to end right over here and then my first object starts right here so there is no unnecessary jumps and trims it does all of that underlay and I like to call that my paranoid underlay because I'm paranoid of what's going to happen I don't want the fabric to show through and then we're going to be done now I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to sew the actual design as it was created onto a uh, piece of material 
and I'm going to hoop it securely and see if the results are better than the sample that was shown within our group because that was pretty drastic and I'm, I'm almost 100% sure that the results were so dramatic because it was floated. So we'll see how it turns out by simply just running it in a hoop and then we will run the uh, edited file beside it and we'll see if we had any better results. Now keeping in mind the big part of this is this design is now completed. There is absolutely no unnecessary trims in the design. There should be no separation of stitches showing the fabric come through and the stitch count has decreased and it has decreased dramatically. We are talking about 30,117 so you know approximately 7,000 stitches almost 7,000 6,800 uh, stitches have been deducted from this design and hopefully will give us better results that is a win as far as I'm concerned We ran both samples and just as I suspected the results were much better with the original file and simply being hooped within the hoop securely. Now the registration still is off in various areas of the design more on one side than the other and if you do turn it over on the side a little bit you can see that little bit of waving happening on the material and a little bit more puckering around the outside because there is 7,000 extra stitches on the design that we edited and did it's nice and flat it has just as much coverage as the other one and all of the satin stitch outlines line up 100 percent perfectly and i don't see any fabric showing through so you know the proof is always in the stitching and you want to make sure you have designs that are friendly on the machine and actually sew out well and look good when they're done so thanks for watching hope you enjoyed this one